G'day everyone, welcome to the Opal Mills. My name's Phil and this channel's all about Opal, from mining, buying parcels, getting Opal, cutting it, <laughs> um, treating it if needed like matrix, um, make doublets, inlay, and we'll even set it in silver and gold. Uh, and amongst other stuff, uh, I've got a big job on at the moment, so I've been a bit quiet. Um, that video is gonna be a little while to come till I finish it. <laughs> so I thought I'd throw this one out there while I'm doing it um, on cutting. So we're gonna cut some stone to a um, specification. And I just wanted to go through, as I've been asked a lot and I see it floating around a lot and everyone's confused on how do I cut opal? How do I cut my opal? And now I've cut my opal, how come it's not right? And, and people are complaining about it. So <laughs> I'm gonna to attempt to just explain What's required of a cut opal? Um, if you're somebody who's often racing with this sort of thing and you're cutting stones, people are buying them and setting them and you haven't had complaints, if you're setting your own and coping, this video is probably not for you. Um, you already know what you're doing. <laughs> but maybe this will be a few things that'll explain something in this nonetheless. So for everyone else, what I'm gonna to attempt to do is explain why we cut not specifically every stone the same, but certain requirements of those stones, there's a couple of options and you have to choose one and there's reasons behind it, like finishing up the backs, um, what a setting edge is, um, angles, all, all the stuff that you're sort of going, well, how do I cut my opal, which shape, how do I do this, where do I start that? what angles do I do this and that and on and I'm just gonna yeah quickly run through a bit of an explanation on uh, different types of cuts to start with uh, I think we'll start there and then we'll narrow it down to a specific type of what we're going to do in this video so to start with it's not like you can't help but notice this picture now I did this up for timeless opals on Facebook uh, due to a um, Comment I was tagged in on people talking about cutting opal and what are the angles and that. And I sort of showed how I do it. So this here will make sense and we'll come back after. Um, it'll make a lot more sense what you're looking at here um, by the time I've finished. Okay, so to start with, here's our color bar. We're just gonna play with this and expand upon all the different cuts as we go down. We'll sh shuffle up. But for the first example of how to cut, or wider cut, um, we're gonna go with literally wall to wall color. No potch, nothing, just color bar. So that's looking down at the top. All right, this is looking obviously through the side. <laughs> what do I do with the camera focus? There we go. Um, so with that in mind, we're gonna need a dome. So this depends on the thickness of this. Now this is not to scale. This could be one inch, one centimeter, or three mil. It wouldn't matter, um, except for the height of the dome you're gonna get. So again, with that in mind, there's proportions for a stone. So uh, to do with its width and its thickness. So the height of the stone should only be no more than two thirds of its width. So for every say nine millimeter of width, you wouldn't go higher than six mil in height with a nine mil width. If you go seven mil, it's just not the bright proportions for, how can you put it? Industry cut, uh, standard cuts, uh, the way TAFE used to teach it. I'll put a link in the description to all that later. Um, but there's, there's a couple of little rules, and one of them is your height does not exceed two-thirds of its width. So, with that in mind, uh, you also don't want to go too thin and then very wide. Otherwise, it's very fragile overall as a stone. So you wouldn't go an inch wide by a mil thick, just or even two mil thick at an inch wide oval, say, would be very thin overall and fragile stone. You want a bit more thickness in it than that, otherwise you'd cut it down to smaller appropriate stones for a two mil thickness. Anyway, so proportions 
you figure that out when you're cutting your stone. But the general gist of it is, you're obviously going to want a dome. So you're going to pick a top. And let's just say our stone starts here. And say to here. And that would make right there our center. And obviously this is the bottom. Now being wall to wall color, there's no point just doing a little medium dome and wasting all this bottom. You wanna maximize this whole stone. Now, when a jeweler sets it, what they're gonna to wanna to do is if there's that much height and it's all color and you don't need to hide any of the back, they'd like as much of the stone pronounced as possible. So when they've got their setting, If you look through the section cut of the setting, you will notice that they've always angled the inside of the setting so that when the stone, 45 on the back of the stone or the roundedness of the stone will sit in on that little angle, stops it falling down but keeps it coming down nice and flush with the metal. See. That's an important thing. Stone needs to meet metal by the end of this and you need to make sure that your stone's finished in a way it comfortably fits up with the metal. So, if that's the setting, the bevel on the inside will allow a certain amount of the stone to sort of duck in under the setting, but they're gonna want this, the dome to start pretty much down by the setting and just come straight up off of there. Okay, so there's no point putting sides, and well, there will be for a little bit of a bezel um, for the setting, but or for claws to clip onto, something to give them something to hang on to. Um, but the most of the stone you want pronounced. So in this example, you'd come up around, and I'm not going to give measurements because again. You know, this is rough proportionates. I, I, by this scale of stone, would want at least that much for the back. Okay? And the rest, I'm going to want a dome. So, with that line there in mind, and my flush sides, and if we were looking at the top, you'd be seeing a nice oval. And we're looking at... at this side here. Okay, so with our doming, one of the first angles we've got to give this is somewhere for the claw or bezel to fold and hang on to. Okay, so if it's got straight up sides, it can't clip on, it'll just pull straight up out. So we need to bring in where the height of, say, the, um, the chloral bezel is around that height for that. And then that tiny bit at the top there is what's going to close over. And it's the gap we're closing because the stone nicely fitting through a hole. If you close that hole once it's through, if you close the top of the hole over a bit, you can't pull it back out because the hole's smaller than what it was when it went in. It just can't come out. And that's all you're doing, whether it's claws or bezel, you're just closing the gap. That's setting, that's it. It's, it's not rocket science, it's a bit of finessing. <laughs> but, so the first thing is, we wanna give it an angle for it to hug onto. And that's where you'll give it, it's, it's around about a 10 or 12 degree um, angle. And I'm gonna to wanna to make sure it evenly starts at this height, not lower. And so it'll look something like that. Neaten this up a bit. Okay. And so that first bit down here is now where the claw can clip over onto and hold the stone down. So from just above there is where the doming is going to start. Well, it's already started there technically, but we're going to start the continuum of the dome to the center. And there's, there's rules to this. Um, if you're cutting calibrated stones and 
they've got about one, two, three angles, and then you just round it from there. But I don't do that, as you will understand that first picture a lot more in a minute. I like to go, all right, from at these points, I'm gonna start more increments than three of angles. All right. And so I'm gonna do a lap around at this height. That's our setting edge. And so this will be my first coming in a bit further angle. So from here, it will start coming in a bit more. And then the next one comes in more, comes in more, comes in more. And that's where I get my nice dome. All right, and all the while I'm spinning the dot stick around and doing each angle. And so then you round it on the soft pads afterwards, which we'll get to. So that's how I get my dome. That's where I go to. That's why I start it there. Then you've got the back. So the back, again, well, it needs to seat in to the setting. And since we've got it, full thick color bar, not much of it needs to be seated in, so proportionally around about that. Now, some can give it a bit of a, a, a boat or a dome bottom, slight dome bottom. Like that. And that'll sit down in the setting. It'll sort of, you know, you gotta center it because it's rounded, it can wobble a bit till it sits flush and straight. As long as the setting's straight and the stone's bottom straight, they'll sit nicely upright. But I like to just give a bevel of about 45 and then flat back. Now that gives the same seating uh, for the setting, but it also, um, well, it allows for a closed back and an open back. And if you've got a boat shaped one and you have a, a closed back, there's only that little point at the bottom that's touching the back. The rest is still resting up there, which is okay, but I like a flat back for it to just sit firmly on. So that's how I'll end up cutting my stones. Um, but yeah, the logic is you've got to prepare a stone that somebody is gonna actually be able to set without touching it up, evening it up, um, you know, having to do it, you need to get it all done or your efforts are for naught, essentially. Um, if it can't be set, it doesn't matter how much of a imitation gemstone it looks. If it's not a gemstone that can be set, it's not a gemstone. It's gem material still. It's almost like it's considered, you can consider it half rough until a stone is finished, ready to set, hence the term gemstones, um, when they're cut properly. So you've got to be cut to gemstones and then, you know, this is trying to explain it for those of you that are trying to cut and again, wondering why aren't I getting anywhere? Why don't people want my stones? There might be some issues you're not seeing and it's just little things. And I'll show you how easy it is later when we cut a stone to do this. So that's one way of cutting that, where you've got color to color. We'll just quickly move on a bit and go, all right, black opal. So the majority of black opal is actually translucent crystal opal, um, naturally affixed to solid colorless black opal um, potch. And so if you remove that potch, you'll lose the black backing and, and the color will just be a clear crystal opal. So for those purposes, you want that little bit of backing on the back. And then same process, same reasoning, you do your stone. And then, again, proportionately, so say that's, that's the next stone there. And of course you can use that black, black potch bottom for your 45. 
got your setting edge, and then you start your dome. To whatever proportions, that might be a bit thick for that width. You might want to go a bit wider for that height of proportions, but this is not the scale, as I said. And nonetheless, you still need a back and you need your dome. Now, of course, there can come a stage where, and we'll go this large for this example, you could have a very thin color bar. And so that could be your color bar. It's not as thick as proportions with the whole stone. And that's all, all pots through here. That's your color bar. So for this, well, you can't have your dome come below into the pot, below the color bar. Well, then you get that black potch outer look uh, as you're holding the stone. It's also called fried egg. So if you're looking at your stone like that and you've gone down past your color bar as you're rounding your domes, that last outer rim will just be a black potch from the top. And then your color will sit in there and it's like, well, you should trim all that off, but now it looks like a fried egg. Anyway. Middle would be around here. Then you've got your setting edge. Say about that much. Something for the claws to clip onto. And then the doming incrementally would go something like that. And so with a stone like that, you might want to trim up the back, which can get some stones very, very thin. Now, if this is already a real thin bar, and say this is only one and a half mil, right? Which makes this probably about three mil thick, four mil thick. You only really want about two mil thick. So if that's four mil and that's one and a half, you go, all right, well, one and a half, we'll give it, no more than two mil for the back. And so now that's your stone. And then somewhere here, you're just gonna have to start giving it its 45. So I'm drawing, drawing sideways here, so. Um, and, and that'll be where your stone sits down into the setting. And then at the setting sits down up to there which will be where the claws and bezel start from, and they clip under here. There's your dome. This, this is all you have to do. Just, just get some nice angles that can sit nicely into a setting. Um, and the top part's the easy part. Um, the hardest part about cutting is making decisions on which way to orientate the stone when cutting. <laughs> That's probably um, the most difficult part. Once you start cutting, that part's repetitive from stone to stone to stone to stone to stone. But deciding which way to cut it, different pieces require different orientations. So there's a lot more to cutting than just the cutting. It's the whole process of making gemstones, not just cutting ovals, cutting cushions. Uh, anyone can sort of do that. They teach kids to do it at a lapidary club, so it can't be that hard. I can do it. Can't, can't be that hard. <laughs> so we're going to simplify it best we can in this video and show you what, what we're going to do. And I'm going to use this piece as an example, as this is a piece that needs cutting in a parcel I'm doing at the moment of the Matrix, if you remember back. It's a large parcel. There's a lot of cutting to do. So we'll, we'll grab this one and go, all right, if I was to cut this one, which we are, how would we cut it? So I'll just go through this piece with you and we'll come to a decision on how we're going to cut it. So just quickly, once you understand what I'm trying to get across in this video, you need to keep it all in mind when purchasing your rough. And you'll see why some rough, just don't touch it. It's not, not if you're trying to make money. If you're trying to have fun, go for it. Opal's a lot of fun. But if you're someone going, oh, I want to sell, I want to make some money, 
Well, you're gonna to have to be very selective about what you buy. How you get it finished will depend on who buys it. Now, if you wanna maybe go into your local jeweler shop and ask them how, how do they like their stones finished? You know, ask around. And if you ever start selling stones and someone keeps buying them, they're gonna want them the same. There's reasons why they're buying them. So you've gotta be consistent in your cutting. Um, and they're going to be happy with the way you've done it and can set it from there, then that's all you need is to meet someone that can set your stuff, um, that you can either sell it to or get it set by them for either reason. But nonetheless, when you're looking at parcels, you're going to start to realise why some stuff, nice and bright, it's all colourful, um, the thin, thin stuff's colourful, the thick stuff's potched with wheat colour, and then by the time you buy it and look for solid stones... You've got nothing but doublet material and one to two in brightness stones. Solid. <laughs> um, that's just the way it is. A lot of the parcels getting around, especially the cheap ones, the affordable ones, these are not money makers. These are practice rough, beginner rough, um, at beginner pricing. Opal's not cheap. Um, you look at the carrot price and the expensive stuff and you go, well, how limited that is. Um, yeah, even the low to mid grade stuff can still cost a bit is what I'm getting at. Um, but other than that, even the low grade to less, it, it should not be some of the prices I'm seeing. Um, how much to discourage the newcomers, I don't know. Uh, people get a false sense of value too. They think they can do what they see on Black Opal Direct or um, Roy's Rocks or Pulitzer Opal, um, Oz Opal. <laughs> quite a few channels now um, and you think you can do what they're doing but without realizing how they're fulfilling including the sales um, the behind the scenes stuff that you don't see it's not as easy as buy opal cut opal and everyone's gonna want it they'll fight over it if you're buying really nice stuff and taking that gamble yeah of course there'll be a lot of people interested in it Hope you bought it at the right price, did the work, and sell it at a profit. But, yeah, you, you'll start understanding what you're buying and why it should be only worth so much because once you start selling it, you're getting an idea of, well, this is all it's worth. Well, the effort I've put in, the money I've put in, has to be, you know, you, you've got to equate to cheaper parcels. Um, the money's just not there by the end. You buy a a thousand dollar parcel and you're going to make what 1500 off of it and that's 500 dollars for all the work you've gone and put in invested money took the gamble and you're barely making minimum wage in australia 25 bucks an hour whatever it is you know by the end of it so you want to be making a profit it's got to be a lot more than that or you know that that's good for those dabbling and trying to get encouraged and figuring it out you know without such a high budget and jumping head first in, that's fine. That gets you the idea. But after that, you're gonna go, hmm, gonna be chasing the bigger stuff. But that's where you go, the market's now reduced. It's, it's select. There's not that much of the kind of material I wanna be cutting. Um, and then you've gotta understand the price. The scrutiny is increased with the higher grade opal, including the cuts, the, um, the finish, the polish. Uh, the orientation, all, all those sorts of things come under greater scrutiny for the higher dollars and fully understandable. <laughs> You're taking that kind of money, you kind of want close to human perfection as possible from the stone. So anyway, bear that this all in mind when you're looking at your next parcel. But on with, let's figure out how to cut this. So this material, I've kind of had it treated. Um, you'll see in the video, we treated it for a test and I figured out which way I'm gonna slice it. I sliced it, gave it another treat and saw what clean pieces were in it, free of cracks, impurities, other rocks. <laughs> and so I ended up with you know a couple of bits like this in amongst everything else. So this one I've got aside um, for a demonstration. And first thing we're gonna do is well, you have to understand, I've already orientated it that that's going to be the face. One of those two, but I like this face better. I've already decided that. And we'll have a look at it and figure out how I came to that decision. Let's give him some water. Okay. We'll get this in the water. A bit of a closer look at it. 
actually. That's a bit closer to what it looks like. I'll zoom into it. So as you can see, there's our face. It's got a bit of color. Hopefully it'll treat a bit better on the second proper treat. There's a bit of color there, reds, blues, touch of green. And then there's that side. Now that side's got more of this black stuff coming in from the host rock. And this one's a bit cleaner. Oops. As you can see with Matrix, it dries out very quick because it's absorbing the water. It's wicking it up. So, let's decide orientation. When looking at it, we go, well, if this was the top, what does it look like? If this was the top, if this was the top, if this was the top, and so forth. And I like that way up. For what's there, that's probably the best player color and flash. Looks a bit dead down there that way up. It's not so bright that way as that way. So we'll go with that way up. Now, don't ask me where I got this. These are things that just fall in your lap sometimes and uh, where are we? There is, however, designer oval, brilliant diamond, colored stone guide. <laughs> right -o. So we'll use these because these represent sizes of uh, calibrated settings and that. And I'm pretty sure if we come down to 17 by 12 here, that's about the size we're going to get out of this stone, maximum. Yep. So I'll go ahead and get that drawn. How many pencils does it take to draw an oval? So there we go. Just fits in. Um, normally I'd trim a corner like that, but this is a little bit small by the time the blade actually goes through. We can't get too close, so it would go through around there. It'd take out about that much. And it only leave that little tiny corner there, and I'm not worrying about that. So the first thing is we go rough this out on the wheel. Yeah. We're on the Wacky wheel. 150 grit, magnetic plate. There's our oval. So I want to get this to the stage where it can go onto a stick. I don't quite like it's, it's not too bad, but this end. So there's a lug sitting off here. So it's got to come off this little. And then it's a bit thinner here than it is here, even with that lug off. So we're just going to square it up with the top as well. Now, I've got a finger underneath, resting that on, and I'm trying to keep it flat. So I don't duck in the bottom or tuck in the top and give the side an angle. I want it to be flush, so I'm keeping it flat. I'm not pushing too hard, I'm being very controlled about what I do, so I don't want to get too close. Looks like we lost our light. Camera's a bit warm. Catch. So there we go, we've got our rub in shape. Now let's sort this back out. Sorry about that, usual story. Camera cut out, ran out of uh, memory space. <laughs> Fun. So, yeah, I was just evening it up. 
so it's flat top to bottom flush so as long as the bottom sits flat the top will sit flat too so as long as we keep it straight and I stick the top will be orientated correctly so I'm just going to get that on the dop stick quickly and we've all seen that before so I'll just quickly do this like so and now we'll just give it that final touch up shape um, to make sure it sort of goes through a hole really down that one so it won't quite go in there yet it's just still got to bring it in a bit and when we do we only want it to just fit the hole so we're very careful about this because after we've got it to shape to fit in the hole that's on a 240 then we're going to go 280 600 1200 cerium to finish it off which will just take a fraction more off if we're not careful too much it'll shrink too much and we'll lose our sizing and shape so we'll go back to the wheel and start cutting so first thing I'm going to do is give it the shape and then you'll see I'm going to give it that first angle in for the setting edge and that won't go all the way to the bottom I'll show you that and best I can and then I'll show you the way I do my laps I call it laps once twice three times <laughs> so each one of those will leave a increment to the dome and how we keep it even so it's all to do with spacing and keeping it square and straight so over to the wheel uh, over on the 240 so as I say first thing let's get that shape into shape Okay. Now, I should mention when doing this bit, it's not easy to see which way the stick's pointing. Now I'm keeping it flush up and down parallel with the wheel so that my sides are flush with the stick so to speak There we go, just fits in perfectly so we don't want to touch the sides down the bottom anymore. If we do, because we're going to touch the top, we'll last the, lose the last bit of that shape we have as soon as we reach the bottom. So we don't want to hit the bottom. So I'm going to go around it, so we'll do this. Let's colour it in pencil so we can see what we're working on. So there we go. Right, so it sticks like that, that's parallel. I'm going to bring it out a slight bit. And you can see that tilt I'm doing. And I'm going to hold that position. So having your hands rested in one position, I'm not wobbling around. I can hold positions very, very well. see I've started that where it's touching up the top only because it's such of a shallow angle I'm getting it won't take long to get to the bottom so I've got to be careful this is real time this is how slow I cut I can do it very controlled because my hands aren't just pushing into the wheel. I'm resting it in the wheel and letting the wheel do the cutting. I'm not forcing the wheel to cut to my whim.
even pressure allows you to get an even grind wear mark so you don't wobble up and down as you go around. dips at the ends with the rotation speed you know, as you're turning it past the sides the speed at which you consistently evenly spin the stone it'll pass past there quicker and then take longer to pass around these um, and help the, the smaller and narrower the opal is the quicker it'll grind away too so broader surfaces won't grind as quick so when you're taking it off you've got a broader surface here and a narrow point surface there as opposed to you know, Subjectively, more of a corner there than a round there. If you can go with my analogy. Um, so you're just going to be careful around your ends when you're putting the pressure on. Hold it evenly, don't push into the wheel. Um, you know, push in just enough pressure to do what you want it to do, and then make it do that all the way around one lap, evenly. Okay, so there we've got it reasonably even. So below that, where that pencil line is, we'll do our little 45 at the bottom. And just above, giving enough space to leave that edge as our setting edge. If you notice the fact that this is like that and it's now tilted like that, it gives that claw or the bezel something to hold onto the stone. Hence, it's called the setting edge. So, from here, I start doing laps around, in incrementing it further and further until we're pointing at the wheel, getting the last of the dome on. So, I suppose again, we'll do this. I'll try and do it in different lines. So, as we go up, you see the different layers I'm speaking of facet lines, rounds, laps. Right. So those lines represent the faceting edge mark. now just so we can still see it. I'm going to do some lines that way. So that's straight, setting edge, first bevel.
Okay. Do one the other way again. And then do the next angle. See that slowly going over into a dome at the top. You can see that over in the middle of where it's still rough there, and you can see what's been cut and how that nice oval is sitting central. Which is good spacing and means even cutting towards the centre, which is good for a central dome. So my angles as I'm mucking around here, I may have to just tuck in a little bit further as I go just to get it to the thickness of this stone adapted and get it right up and, and different width stones are going to get a different curve to the centre depending on the thickness to the width of the centre and the same with the outside radius. So I'm just going to go back there on that angle. this next time. See that oval is getting smaller and smaller. So the dome's almost at the centre and down to where I want it to be as far as it can come down before it hits the setting edge. Bit of the center out. So, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see them because I've stacked them so close together. There's little lap marks that run up here, and each one's got a little pointy ridge. And that's where these soft pads are going to come into it. First thing that we do is going to put this 280 on, and the water. And what we're going to be doing is a bit of a repeat of what we just did so we're going to do the sides very gently just enough to get the last marks out and leave these marks in nicely and then the setting edge but from there there's going to be a lot of rocking 
down to the center, down to the center, down to the center, and turning the stick as I do it. And this helps get all the scratch marks flowing in one direction up towards the center. And if you do it evenly, you wear it even, you won't put your stone out of shape at this point. So. Very gently. These may be soft pads, but they're 280 from 240, so they'll still do a bit of wearing if I let them too hard. But I'm literally just, you know, resting the stone there. It's not going to wear anything down too, too much. It's just going to hopefully just take out the scratches. Setting edge. Now they'll do a bit of this. Very lightly. I do spin it this way just to knock off any facet marks I'm putting in it that way because this is 240 about 280 and I've got my finger set here as a stop so it stops on a certain angle without going right over my setting edge these are little tricks you'll learn as you practice cutting and try and maintain shapes that for a light source and I'm sort of pretty happy with it. It's done the bulk of what I need done coming straight off the 240. Now we'll give it something a little bit more forgiving. We'll go to a 600 grit. So again so I'm happy on that and all this is is when you when I say I'm happy I'm, I'm happy enough that what I did with that wheel What's left, I can go on with the next one. Grit, sorry, not wheel. It's one wheel on this thing. <laughs> so. Same again. This is 1200 grit, so it doesn't really do too much damage at all. So, it's more forgiving if you spend a bit of time on it. It's not going to hurt the stone. Setting edge. really feel this just sliding smoothly on this wheel now. A lot of it's also by feel what you're doing here, not just by what you see. You've got to be in tune with your equipment a bit, a bit like driving a car if you've got a license and you drive. And you sort of, you can you hear the sound of the engine, you can feel the foot pedals, the steering, and combined it forms this bigger picture than just one, you know, one thing like sight alone. You can't just do it by sight, you've got to go by feel as well. But it's kind of all those things rolled into one. Okay, 
Look at that. It's not making a really nice pre-polish. So off 1200, I'm just going to go straight onto the uh, cerium. Um, I'll do that off camera. It's just the cerium as I do every other stone. Same process that way and then rock. I'll come back after. Uh, there we go. That's polished. And cleaned with a dirty t-shirt. So we've got a polish on it. And some would say, why would you do the cerium now? Why would you use cerium and matrix? It'll plug the pores. Yeah, i got an ultrasonic cleaner. <laughs> Snap. So that'll get all that out. So you can see the silhouette's a bit hard with that dark shadow on the top. We'll come over to the table and have a look at this. All right. Let's just put it back in here. You're getting closer to a, you know, somewhere in between. As you can see, we did lose a bit in the uh, polishing process, just a fraction. Still fits. Um, I'd say it's about half a mil out. Get this off the top stick, turn you over. All right, so there we are. So we're going to be doing this part here. So yeah, the 45 on the bottom, back over the wheel. What we'll do, I'll color it in again so you can see what we're wearing down and how far. Okay, hopefully you can discern the difference between the pencil and the treatment just there. So that's our edge, the flat above that is where the dome starts. So, let's get some water on, okay. Stick on the 45, not that way, not that way, but there, 45. Very lightly. Do my long edges first. Short ones will be very easy to trim up. left enough there to retain our shape looking from above and that last bit will get rounded in a minute in the soft pads anyway you can see the 45 there now that's that edge that the uh, setting is going to match and it's going to sit down to where that grey starts in that line and then everything above that should be shown, everything below it should be hidden. Just a light touch just to bring it right up because I like to get it close. Also that will be even all the way around, so that this, when it sits down, it will sit flush and level, not lopsided or anything. So, just going to touch on the flat just to give it a 240 grit. So we'll give it a bit of a, at least a 1200 finish on the back. So again, I'm just going to go through the pads, doing that again, and I'll even try and get this treated so we can see how it's going to actually turn out. Alright, so, all finished on the back, it's a 1200 finish, that's good enough for this purpose, it can always be re 
finish polish it up afterwards if I really choose. You can see that line of light running around there, keeping a nice distance from the bottom. That's the 45 we just put in. Then we've got a little bit of, so we have to zoom in I think. Get a pointer stick. So we've got our 45 there. We've got a little bit of edge up there. And then the dome starts from there over. If I sort of highlight that equator, just keeping the pencil flush, you can see that line. Oops. Okay, so that's the remainder of our original shape out shape, because under here we've 45'd it. And up here we've domed it, but it's still got that little faint line there and any of that disappeared around it and your over would kick in somewhere, be out of shape. So I'm hoping this somehow makes a bit of sense and helps. And this is just the way I cut them. This is not 100% how everyone has to cut or anyone cuts. There's lots of different ways and that's just this specific oval. This had potched back about two thirds of the way up, that dome wouldn't have started till two thirds of the way up and that back would have been a 45. So you adjust to the opal. If you can see that in your rough, you know you can cut that out of it. But if you can't see something, once you've started cutting stones, if you can't see what you need to get out of it in the rough part, it's just not there. You've got to um, then get around cracks, sands, potch, um, the pattern, the way it produces through some bigger material, sometimes you'll cut it down for that nicer part and where there's weaker colour around it, you get the nice bright part, you isolate it, cut a nice stone, you'll get a good top dollar for that and then you cut smaller, um, lesser stones out the rest of it. But yeah, if you're left at a big piece with a little bright spot, it lessens the price of the bright part because it's still attached to weak stuff. So, you know, there's all these decisions on how to chop, to cut, um, to face and hopefully this helps somewhat so I'm not going to ramble too much I'm going to see how much time I've got left in editing and I'm going to treat this and if I can I'll squeeze in this finished stone at the end of this um, but I've got maximum of an hour before I have to make it a two-parter so yeah cheers uh, just a quick update next day I did do a quick treat on it and going for another one but there we go. That way is best orientation for it. Play of colour. You go that way, you still get play of colour. Yeah, I think that's the best display. So there we go.